Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In honor of our graduates today, I've chosen the preaching text from the book of Micah of the Old Testament. But before I read it, I'd like to set the scene for you, as it was a time in Israel's history when the once great nation was in crisis, when with corrupt and violent leadership, greed running rampant, disregard for justice, pagan idolatry, whose kings and leaders lived in luxury off the backs of the laborers and farmers, neglecting the needs of the poor, the sick, and the marginalized. Israel had become a nation that had forgotten its identity as the chosen people of God. Enter prophet Micah. Some 700 years before the birth of Jesus, he was one of the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament who was claimed and sent by God as a messenger to warn God's chosen people of their impending doom, that their atrocities against God, God's law, and God's people would soon see God choosing to abandon them, leaving them subject to the sure brutal occupation of the neighboring nation of Assyria who were chomping at the bit to conquer and destroy the nation of Israel. There was nothing, said Micah, but destruction and despair awaiting Israel's future. Yet Micah, at the same time, still offered hope and instruction as to how they could get back on the right path with God, how to reconnect with what is of true value to God in a world that had somehow forgotten. Now, as we read from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, we hear the plea for restoration. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? To which Micah responds, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy and kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Here ends the reading. And so as the reading reveals, we see a laundry list of what is valuable to the world, a list of possessions, money, livestock, tradable goods, never mind that they may have been the result of ill-gotten gains. But the Israelites called on God and said, if we gave all that we possessed, would you finally release us from our sins? Can we make a holy transaction so our nation might be restored? But Micah offered an answer that has nothing to do with transaction, nothing to do with buying forgiveness. God is not calling for an exchange of goods, ill-gotten or otherwise. God is calling the nation of Israel for a change of heart, a, renew, a renewed focus on the values of the heart, of justice, mercy, and humility. And it's not like the Jews hadn't heard this before. They knew the stories of their heritage, of their heroes who exemplified just these qualities, of King Solomon, Daniel, Esther, the prophets, just to name a few. But Israel's pursuit of power and prestige had a way of plugging their ears, blurring their vision, and hardening the hearts against the plight of those who suffered among them, the very people whom God had so spe specifically called to be tended to. And I have to ask, is it any different today? Do you recognize any similarities in Israel's state of affairs as they described in Micah's time and those of today? The pursuit of power and prestige, political disarray, economical dysfunction, cultural despair. Sound familiar? And in the midst of this clamor, are we able to hear Micah's words? Are we even listening? Do we know what it is to act with justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? And are there any heroes today we might point to, to give us hope, to show us the way? Well, I can offer you one such individual for your consideration. 
and his name is Merrick Bush. Merrick is a young man who wrestles for his high school out of Utica, New York. He is a fine wrestler whose hard work has rewarded him with an undefeated season and a trip to the state championship, where he would wrangle with Logan Patterson, who has a year of experience on Merrick to start with, but also is well touted for his impressive undefeated record. So Merrick sets his sights on the championship and begins to train all the harder to prepare for the big match. Yet, for all his hard work, meeting his competitor face to face on that big day turned out to be a bigger challenge than he expected. In fact, his challenger proved to be an exceptional worthy opponent. As the match continued and with only 30 seconds left on the clock, it looked like Merrick would lose his first match of the season and at the state championship of all places. But things suddenly took a surprising turn. In the exchange of wrestling moves, somehow Logan's arm was twisted badly, so badly that a timeout had to be called. And soon it was clear that it was an injury that would leave Logan without full use of his arm. And at this point, Merrick must have realized that there was no way that Merrick couldn't win this match. It would just be a matter of taking Logan, Logan down and pinning him, taking the match and taking the championship. And so with the referee's whistle, the young man faced off for the final 30 seconds of the match as Logan's injured arm hung helplessly at his side. Merrick took his stance and the crowd leaned forward waiting for him to take the easy victory. But strangely enough, Merrick didn't make the first move. Merrick didn't even make the second move. As the puzzled crowd watched as Merrick offered no resistance, allowing Logan to use his good arm to pull him off his stance. And the crowd began to murmur, what is Merrick up to? Then Logan easily took Merrick down with that one good arm. And the crowd began to figure out what was happening as they one by one rose to their feet and began to applaud as Merrick allowed Logan to pin him for the victory. And the entire gym rang with applause for the two young men who truly fought the good fight and for Merrick who refused to take advantage of his competitor's misfortune to claim false victory at Logan's expense. Before the injury, Merrick knew he'd been beat. But his sense of ethics, his sense of justice and mercy too, couldn't allow him to take advantage of Logan. And so Merrick took the loss with dignity and integrity and humbly congratulated his rather dazed competitor. There was no victory dance, no self-congratulatory fist pumps in the air. Just two young men standing there, surrounding by a cheering crowd who knew they'd just witnessed something beyond extraordinary. So following the match, the media caught up with Merrick for an interview. And Merrick wraps up his account of the match with the statement, I suppose people will think I'm weak for doing this. People will think you are weak for doing this? Well, if that's weakness, let me tell you about another man who the world also called weak. A man who hung on the cross, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who could have called on the powers of the universe to save himself, to obliterate his enemies, to rule the world with power and might. But instead, he walked the path of humility, stood among the powerful and corrupt, and said, enough is enough. The man who followed God's call for justice and mercy, who laid his life down for all of the world, no, Merrick, what you did wasn't weak. It was standing strong for justice, mercy, and kindness, which is at the very core of God's identity. Because the heart that chooses right over might, that chooses kindness over self-interest, is the heart that beats in time with our Creator God. And there is nothing more that God wants from us or for us that we walk as his children alongside him, to drink from his amazing, amazing, gracious love for us that we may in turn 
humbly serve and love God's people as we are called. So let us go forth and dare to answer God's call to act with justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>